long preserved for our walk in this world. They resound with God's own heart. Oh, let the ancient words impart words of life, words of hope. They give us strength, help us cope in this world. Wherever we roam, ancient words will guide. never changes and we thank you for the opportunity that we have to come together as individuals who've been redeemed by the precious blood of the lamb and worship you and praise your name and listen to what the spirit of God has for us through those words of life. Lord, we are grateful for the fellowship that we can have. Thank you so much for bringing us here safely. We pray for this service. We're praying that our eyes would be focused on our eternal Redeemer. We lift up the name of Jesus, and it's our desire to have the Spirit of God promote him even more in our hearts, in our minds, and that we truly can have a deeper experience because of this time that we are spending together with you. We pray for those online. We ask, Lord, that you would help them as they are listening wherever they are. We pray that they would be light and salt. And we pray for those who will be hearing the word today, not just here, but all around the world who have never trusted you, that they will hear the words of life that lead them to re repentance and to receiving that free gift of eternal life that you have for them. Lord, we give you honor and glory. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Hey, before you. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and who meditates on his law day and night. 
That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season. Psalm 1, 1 through 3. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season. Psalm 1, 1 through 3. Oh, victory. Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about his healing, of his cleansing power revealing, how he made the lame to walk again, and caused the blind to see. And then I cried, dear Jesus, come and heal my broken spirit. And somehow Jesus came and brought to me the victory oh victory in jesus my savior forever he sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood he loved me ere i knew him and all my love is through him he plunged me about a mansion he has built for me in glory and i heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea and about the angel singing and the old redemption story and some sweet day i'll sing up there the song of victory Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is due. Plunge me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. He plunged me. Don't 
speak in vain, no syllable empty or void. For once you have spoken, all nature and science follow the sound of your your breath evolving in pursuit of what you said if it all reveals your nature so alive I can see your heart in everything you say every painted sky you can of your grace If creation still obeys you so So will I If the mountains bow in reverence So will I If the oceans roar your greatness So will I For if everything exists to lift you high So will I If the wind goes where you say You chased down my heart through all of my failure and pride. On a hill you created the light of the world, abandoned in darkness to die. And as you speak, a hundred billion failures disappear We lost your life so I could find it Could I'm bound to your desire? You're the one who never leaves the one behind. 
that song is <laughs> very powerful. As I was, you know, picking out the songs for this week, um, that song was the first one because it's just, I started a new devotional and it's teaching me how to live um, a life reflecting Jesus. And as I was going through my devotional and um, thinking of the songs that I would like to, that I wanted to share this morning, I, this thought came to mind and I wrote it down, well, typed it out, but I'd like to share it with you. Uh, everything I have is because of the Lord. God will always make a way. He walks and talks with me every day. Uh, I will keep my eyes fixed on the Lord. This life is bigger than me, and I want to reflect Jesus. Uh, that takes patience, it takes discipline, and it takes strength. Um, we can't go through this life without his protection, his love. We need to surrender what we have to him and lay it at his feet and pray for guidance and direction. Um, so that kind of leads into this next song of Lord, I Need You. Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my Jesus, 
to break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. Lord, we thank you for today. Thank you for meeting us here. Uh, I pray that we would just um, draw near to you and um, reflect you, choose to reflect you. I pray that we would just have open hearts today to receive the words that are given to us through Pastor Dave. Uh, I pray that you would uh, direct our steps throughout this week and we would just lean on your understanding and not our own. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord. Gianna, what a uh, entrance into what we're looking at today. Um, I thank God for what I'm seeing happen in, in your life. I praise God for the boldness. And the call for us today is very simple, to understand that there is power in the name of Jesus. And he does break every chain. I'm so grateful that we have young people here in, in our church family. We're, we're small, but we are seeing a great work happen in the hearts of our youth. And I am so grateful for that. God often ushers in revival through the prayers and through the sincerity of young people. And I'm so grateful that we are, are seeing such um, a zeal for the Lord. Um, Jesus has to be everything. I am so thankful that through the years I have been able to see Jesus remain so faithful and true to his word. And the older we get, we know that our, our days certainly are numbered. But I am so thankful that we have young people who are recognizing the value of bucking the system, of not compromising, and doing what God has called them to do. Your testimony today that you are starting a new devotional, that you typed down some words, that's powerful. Powerful. Never underestimate the power of your testimony, just simply sharing your experience and what the Lord is stirring your heart to do. Sometimes we neglect to truly reveal what the Lord is doing in our life because we're afraid we might be misunderstood. But listen, if you are truly speaking from what the Lord, the Holy Spirit is doing in your life, the Holy Spirit of God prompting you to give that testimony has something of great value for someone else to hear. That's why we need to speak up. I want you to take your Bibles and turn to a very familiar passage. And I'm actually going to be speaking um, to you today from a text and actually bringing up some of the same things that I said almost two years ago to this date. We're speaking today on revival. Uh, before we get to that scripture, let me say a few things. There has been a lot of talk today about the spontaneous revival that recently started on a small college campus uh, called Asbury University. This Wesleyan movement school has a tradition of revivals and a theology that teaches people to watch and to uh, wait for divine wind to blow. The university is named for Francis Asbury, the early American Methodist bishop who encouraged and celebrated revivals from Maine to Georgia and from Maryland to Tennessee. I um, am a uh, student of revivals, contemporary revivals, also the revivals we find in scripture. And I just appreciate um, hearing uh, about revivals that are occurring right now in present time. According to one account, the revival began at a chapel service on February 8th. Now I'm, I'm actually going to be reading from a report, a news report. Zach Merkrebs, the assistant soccer coach, who is also the leadership development coordinator for the missions organization Envision, preached about becoming love in action. 
his text was Romans chapter 12. As he started, Coach Zach told the students who are required to attend three chapels per week that he wasn't aiming to entertain them. And he said these words, do not focus on me. He went on to say, I hope you guys forget me. My desire is for the Holy Spirit and God's word to find fertile ground in your hearts and produce fruit. He went on to say, Romans 12 is our focus. God's word, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit moving in our midst. That's what we're hoping for. Coach Zach also talked to them about the experience of God's love in contrast to the radically poor love that is narcissistic, abusive, manipulative, and selfish. He says, some of you guys have experienced that kind of love even within the church. He said, maybe it wasn't violent, maybe it wasn't molestation, but it feels like someone pulled a fast one on you. They told you about this love, and yet you've never seen it. God's love was proclaimed. But his love was not manifested in the actions of people around you. It's time for each of us, he said, to be the example of love in action. After all, God's love is deep. It's forgiving. It's real. It's transformational. The love of God flowing to, in, and through us can radically change a person, a family, a church, a university, and a community. He gave the invitation. No one came forward at the end of the service. And Coach Zach was convinced that he totally whiffed. He blew it. In fact, this is the text he sent his wife. I just gave the latest stinker. I'll be home soon. In other words, he was convinced that nothing was gained. His evaluation based on what he could not see, which was the stirring of the Holy Spirit in the hearts of a few students, led him to believe that he had failed in the message. And he did exactly what he told them not to do. He told the students, don't focus on me, but he focused on himself. So he felt defeated. A black gospel trio sang a final song and chapel ended, but 18, 19 students stayed back. They stayed in several clusters, a few along the right wall. So a few were in their seats, a few on the floor in the aisle, and a few at the foot of the stage. They kept praying. They were crying out to God. Zeke Atha, a junior, told a documentarian a few days later that he was one of the ones that remained in the chapel. He left after an hour to go to a class, but then when he got out, he heard singing. Zach, or Zeke said, okay, this is weird. And he went back to the chapel. He said it was almost surreal. He walked in and the peace that filled the room was unexplainable. He and a few friends immediately left, being, believing that they were prompted by the Holy Spirit, and they sprinted around campus, bursting into classrooms with this announcement, revival is happening. That was the early stage of what we have been told was happening at Asbury for two weeks. Psalm 85, verse 6 says, Will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? Psalm 85 is a prayer for restoration that is rooted deeply in the realm of trust and faith in God. Most Bibles have this heading with Psalm 85. This psalm is to the chief musician, a psalm of the sons of Korah. The setting for the psalm appears to be the restoration of the people of God following a great catastrophe. Perhaps it was the Babylonian captivity 
about 50 years after Jerusalem's fall in 586 BC. That's what I'm thinking. With this psalm, the people prayed for a revival that would be rooted deep in the soul of their hearts, transforming their spiritual walk, and would also bring renewal to their land. I want you to listen to the first seven verses of Psalm 85. Lord, you have been favorable to your land. You have brought back the captivity of Jacob. You have forgiven the iniquity of your people. You have covered all of their sin. Selah. You have taken away all your wrath. You have turned from the fierceness of your anger. Restore us, O God, of our salvation. And cause your anger toward us to cease. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger to all generations? Will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? Show us your mercy, Lord, and grant us your salvation. Lord, we pray that that can be our heart prayer today. In Christ's name. You know, I am so thankful that we are seeing, uh, seeing revival stories um, appearing on our radar. Anytime the name of Jesus is lifted up, it's an opportunity for God's mercy and salvation to be known. There are many examples of revival in God's word, revivals in Christian history, and we see those revivals documented as spontaneous, unplanned events. To see evidence of a Holy Spirit sustained revival in our time encourages me and it motivates me to humble myself before God, to do what God told Solomon to do in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, to pray, to seek the face of God, to turn away from wicked ways and to cry out to him for restoration. Right now, our brothers and sisters in Cameroon are going through 40 days of fasting and prayer. They just started it. Last week, I got a text message from Tantor Joseph, and he said, we have heard news of a revival at a college campus in America, and it has motivated us to be seeking God right now for revival and for refreshing right here in Cameroon. Man, boy, that inspired me. I mean, sometimes we look at those things and we dismiss it. And sometimes those who claim to know Christ can be the greatest cynics of a mighty move of God. Our brothers and sisters around the world are hearing these reports and it is motivating them to seek restoration and revival in their own lives. There's no question that fear in our society is very prevalent. Fear continues to intimidate so many people. Fear manipulates and paralyzes believers. There's no question that there is corruption throughout the world. There's no shortage of deceit. Many people around us are now very bold in calling good evil and calling evil good. 50 years ago, there was a God consciousness in America. But today, humanism and secularism have become the persuasive ideology. Persecution against individual believers and local churches is expanding. Biblical principles are being rejected, especially in our public classrooms. Followers of Christ are being targeted and marginalized. They're trying to be canceled by a society that has its own interest at heart. Many are convinced that our generation is at the point of no return. I hear it almost every week, at least once. That there's really no hope 
for any kind of turn for America. And yet I would like to suggest to you today that while humanly speaking, in the flesh, all hope might be gone, we do have a powerful, sovereign, almighty, all-knowing, awesome, truly wonderful, merciful, holy, just, loving, long-suffering, ever-present God who is still on the throne. Amen. And as long as we have breath, as long as we are here, shouldn't you and I pray, Oh Lord, will you not revive us again? that your people may rejoice in you. How can anyone not agree with that, especially after we had a young lady up here speaking about her relationship with Jesus Christ, confessing to us that it's hot, that she's in that devotional realm, that she's willing to lead us to surrender to Christ. How can any of us deny this scripture. Oh Lord, will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? The word revival means to refresh, to restore life, to live abundantly. D.M. Patton said, revival is the inrush of the Holy Spirit into the life that threatens to become as a corpse. Paul Rees declared revival and evangelism, although closely linked, are not to be confused. Revival is the experience of the church. Evangelism is the expression of the church. A revived people will become a people that follows and enacts the Great Commission. We have a great God who is still and always will be on the throne. Nothing is impossible for him. I'm asking you today to believe with me that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I'm asking you to take God at his word. Call unto me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you cannot imagine. I'm asking you today to rise up out of cynicism and believe with me that we, just like the people in this psalm who found themselves in captivity with their cities burned and the temple of God destroyed, can also cry out to the Lord with these words, will you not revive us again? And then believe that God can do it. Real revival cannot be produced by man. It can't, it can't be. We can try to have a counterfeit view of it. We can pretend, we can get all emotional. And by the way, in revival, there is great emotion. How can you not have great emotion when you understand the great love and awesome nature of our God? But emotion alone can't produce revival. This is what we can do. We can pray for it. We can seek it. We can seek for it. But once again, as men and women, we can never just simply will it into existence. Revival comes as a result of the Holy Spirit's stirring and the touching of our hearts. Our response is the, is the key. Our response to the stirring and the leading of the Holy Spirit is key. Our intentional action to respond to the Holy Spirit's leading must be purposeful and it must be specific. Three things, three simple things. We were talking about this in Sunday school today. God lays it out so simply for us. We complicate it. The simple truth is this. He's put life and death in front of us. There is blessing and cursing. He told the people of old, choose life. Jesus stood outside of the church of Laodicea because he wasn't present in the church. Can you imagine that? They had the name, but they had no personal experience. He's outside. He's knocking at the door, telling them, let me in and I'll give you this. There's always a response to be made, and it's, it's, it's simple what we need to do. Number one, we need to humble ourselves before God. That means we deny ourselves. He must increase, and we must decrease. I was um, looking at the Welsh revival, 1914, or 1904 to 1906, and um, I'm in the process right now of, of digesting that again. And one, one of the 
the men in that revival that had an impact around the world said this, you never see a man carrying his cross ever return to where he came from. That's powerful. The symbolism there. If we are going to experience revival, we need to humble ourselves. He must increase. We must decrease. We must die to self. Only way to do that is to humble ourselves before God. Number two, we need to pray and seek his face. No substitute. Prayer is what ushers in God's miraculous movement. I uh, have been having a, a few health issues. And a week ago, this past Friday, at 4 a.m., the Lord woke up an individual in Bolivar, and he related this to me. He said, Dave, I don't know what it was, but God just stirred my heart to pray for you. A few hours later, while I was down here at the chapel, I get a text message from a brother sitting right here today. He said, Dave, I'm just praying right now specifically for this thing that's going on in your life. An hour after that text message, I get a call from a man that is in this room. I've never discussed my problem with any of those individuals I'm mentioning to you. And they may have heard about it in different ways, um, heard about it after the fact that it happened, but I got another phone call and the, the man said, Dave, I'm praying for you. And I could tell he was emotional. He was maybe, maybe crying for me. I don't know. But he was praying with sincerity. It was obvious. I'm thinking, man, Lord, thank you for this. This is just amazing. Went to the hospital and went to visit um, a couple of people that were, were there. And there is a uh, couple from this church in the room visiting as well and I went to pray for uh, the people there and just before I did that the 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 man uh, left the room and I didn't think that he was offended that I was praying it just didn't know why he left I finished praying and we were talking he came back into the room and he had a bottle of anointing oil he said, I've misprompted in my spirit to pray over people in this room. And he prayed over the two women that were there, and then he prayed over me and prayed over Daisy. Late Friday afternoon, the problem that had plagued me for three weeks not only was diminished, it was gone to the point that I could once again, sleep in bed, which I haven't been able to do for three weeks. Only reason I'm sharing that with you is because people were prompted by the Spirit of God to pray. They didn't know exactly what they're praying for, necessarily. But they followed obediently what the Spirit of God was instructing them to do. They were praying they were praying because they were led to pray. Those are the three things that are so important for us to consider as we look at revival. Number one, we humble ourselves. Number two, we pray. We seek the face of God. Do you know what it is to seek the face of God? Have you ever seen a young child go up to their parent and they, they get up onto their lap and what do they do? They just going like this with their face and they love to they love to seek the face of their parent there's security there there's life there there's warmth there that is how we need to approach God he is not a God that is so removed that we've got to yell to him from a distance man we can run to him and seek his face and touch him and ask him as our father 
will you not revive me again? And as the Holy Spirit leads us, we need to get serious about obedience. Repentance is not just feeling sorry. Repentance brings us into alignment with God's word. The Holy Spirit convicts us of sin in such a way that we are broken. The blinders are removed. If through prayer we invite God to revive us, we must be, be, be prepared to let go of the things that are offensive to God, to embrace holiness, to walk humbly with God, yielding to the Holy Spirit, no longer grieving or quenching the Holy Spirit. If you and I truly want revival, it is something that we cannot just um, ask for and think is going to happen without us doing those simple fundamental things. We are humbling ourselves. We are praying. We are seeking the face of God. We are obeying the Holy Spirit's instructions. And if the Spirit of God is bringing any one of us under conviction and we are unwilling to let go of that sin or repent of that sin, how can God do a work in us? He can't. We've got to be willing to let go of that which is offensive. And too often we don't even know what some of that is anymore. Because we've been desensitized by our lack of study and our lack of seeking God. We need to get serious. I began our time with a news report about the recent Asbury revival, so I'm going to end it in the same way. Here's a report that just came out three days ago. The Asbury University Christian revival may be winding down. Still, students continue to express their love of God, praying, worshiping, and telling stories about how the outpouring of God's Spirit forever changed the lives of many on the small Kentucky campus. One such story was told this past Thursday during the university's collegiate day of prayer, an evening service mainly composed of those 25 and younger. The event served as a fitting back bookend to two weeks of travelers coming from across the world to participate in the prayer services occurring within Hughes Auditorium in Wilmore. One senior, Gracie Turner, admitted that she did not initially partake in prayer service like, like the other students. In fact, Turner had not been a practicing Christian for years. A senior at the college, at a Christian college, but she was not living a life of a, of a believer. Growing up, she recalled attending church with her family in the countryside. She liked going to church. She was passionate about it. Sometimes she would get up and share testimonies or, or scripture uh, with, with the people in the room. But then her faith was rocked when her beloved great-grandmother died of cancer in 2019. Something had broken in the family unit and fighting and turmoil ensued with her death. I had to witness my great-grandma, who I dearly loved, being taken away from us, Gracie said. That happened one month before she came to Asbury. She went on to say this, before my great-grandmother's death, I had been so excited to attend Asbury, yet that excitement turned into dread. As I started my college career, the only person I could think of to blame for my anxiety, depression, sadness was God. Gracie said solemnly, I really resented him. She cried every day, she was homesick, Asbury would frequently throw around the word community. We all belong to a community. But Turner truly believed that she was never going to be part of that community. After coming to Asbury, the only time I would talk to God, she said, was when I woke up in the morning and said, God, it would be really nice if you just didn't wake me up in the morning and you did something else for me. For three years, she wanted nothing to do with religion or faith. When others prayed during chapel, she simply sat there with her head up, eyes focused. When it came to singing, she did not participate. And she had no desire to worship at all. On the first day of the revival, 
Gracie recalled that the chapel felt somewhat different, but it still felt like the mandatory chapel students have to go to every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. She noticed some people staying after, and she considered for a moment staying herself, but she had classes in physical therapy. At therapy, Gracie began to cry and told her trainer about her worsening mental health. She had recently sustained an injury and she really felt like she was at her breaking point. At that moment, she received a text from one of her friends, come to Hughes Auditorium, something is happening. She thought nothing of it, but still she decided to walk into the auditorium. And there she saw people crying, laying across the floor, worshiping and praying in mass. Sitting in the back, Gracie started experiencing something that day. It began with tears and eventually a prayer. She cried and started to pray. For the first time in three years, she spoke to God personally. She said, at that moment, it felt like God was telling me, this is what you're missing. Gracie slumped down in her seat and finally felt she could relax. She said, I did feel a sense of peace. But more than that, she was actually seeing that she could become part of a community. Several days later, she awoke with revival on her mind. Again, she cried. She worshiped. She prayed inside the glow of the auditorium. Time passed quickly, and after a while, Gracie realized she had been there for five hours. At one point, those on stage asked if people wanted to come up and share something. Gracie said, I'm not the biggest public speaker. I hate being on camera. I hate being in front of people, even if it's just one person. Yet, she said, I was impressed to get up. Slowly, she walked up to the front of the room, to the podium, as 1,000 unrecognizable faces watched. She began to speak. She said, since coming to Asbury, I have resented God. I have not lived the life of a believer. For the next few minutes, minutes she continued sharing that story. As soon as she finished, the crowd began praying over her, hugging her, crying with her. As she was going back to her seat, people reached out to grab her arms. The event caused Gracie to think differently. It made her realize that you can be vulnerable amid all of the loneliness and isolation and sadness. For Gracie, telling people how she had been feeling the past three years felt good, but she still did not make a solid decision to follow Jesus. On Friday the following week, now the revival is starting to wind down, her husband drove up from Tennessee for the revival. He didn't recall that she had gone to the school. Perhaps that was part of God's plan. Once there, they ran into each other. He was headed for the auditorium. Gracie said, I'm not sure if I'm, I'm going to go. But eventually, she found herself following her cousin and she walked in and the only seats available were up front, right by the stage. Coach Zach Murkribs was speaking again and he gave an invitation, just like he did at the beginning. He said, if anyone wants to come to repent of sin and come back to God, now is the time to do so. Gracie Turner stood up almost immediately as it seemed something or someone was pulling her up without actually touching her. As she stood, people began clapping around her. And then several others stood up as, as well. Her cousin walked to the front, grabbed her hand. They began walking to the altar together. She repented of her sin, and not long after that decision, she was baptized. What a difference, she said. I'm at peace now. My anxiety and depression is no longer controlling me as I talk to God and I give it all to him. Gracie went on to say, I'm not alone. I am redeemed. I am now revived. My past is behind me for good. 
Gracie cautions against the idea of tying the power of faith to the glass painted windows of Hughes Auditorium or the cobblestone walkways of Asbury University. For seniors like her, it is time to take up jobs and careers and hope the small town's real life revival story inspires revivals in other college campuses and parts of the world. This is what she said as she was closing her interview out. She said, this isn't about me, this isn't about Asbury, this isn't about uh, an auditorium. This is about a loving God working and transforming lives. I mean, he transformed my life. Listen, the power of the Holy Spirit to lift up Christ is alive and well today. Will you not revive us again? It's all about individuals coming to that place where their seeking of God becomes so important that they continue through and, and do not allow distractions to keep them from that ultimate place where they are humbling themselves, praying, seeking the face of God, and being obedient to the Holy Spirit's instructions. I don't know what God has in store for Gracie, but I do know that her story is going around the world. It will have an impact. The Spirit of God will use testimonies of God's work in people's lives so that other people can understand there is hope. And one of the great things about a revival is that it is an inrush of the Holy Spirit into the church. But when that is taking place, Unbelievers who are outside the body of Christ are drawn in like a magnet draws in steel. And they hear the good news of Christ. Even those who are resenting God, even those who have rejected God, even those who once thought they knew God and decided that he wasn't going to help them are people that are drawn back to that saving realm so that they can experience what we know and that is that Jesus Christ came to seek and to save the lost and when an individual hears the gospel and responds through repentance and faith they can have that free gift of eternal life and when that happens the spirit of God takes up residence but too often we grieve the spirit we quench the spirit we walk away from the principles of the word of God. Sometimes it's so subtle, we don't even really realize that it's happening. But then the spirit of God, who doesn't leave us, the spirit of God will prick our hearts and will point out that sin. And it behooves us at that point. It is something that we need to truly hear. Jesus said this, if you have an ear to hear, let him hear what the spirit is saying to the churches. What he's saying to you as individuals, if we hear the Spirit of God convincing us, convicting us of some sin that's offensive to God, it is in our life, we need to react with obedience and repent of it and move forward, denying ourselves, picking up our cross and following Jesus. Revival can come. Will you not revive us again. Lord, you have been favorable to your land. You have brought back the captivity of Jacob. You have forgiven the iniquity of your people. You have covered all their sins, Selah. You have taken away all your wrath. You have turned from the fierceness of your anger. Restore us, O God, of our salvation and cause your anger toward us to cease. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger to all generations? Will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? Show us your mercy, Lord, and grant us your salvation. Cynical skeptic, you have not killed God with your noisy unbelief. He is alive and able to transform lives today. He is the God of revival, not just in past generations, but in our generation today. All I'm asking you to do is to cry that prayer out to God and let's watch 
God do it again and repeat it again until the day that Jesus Christ comes. I'm looking forward to that day when the King of Kings, the great Messiah comes. He is coming into the clouds. The dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them to meet them in the, to meet the, the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. That day is approaching, and I want to be ready. Jesus said he's going to come like a thief in the night. Watch. Watch, he says. And part of watching is being willing to pray always. Will you not revive us again. When we stand before Jesus, don't you want to be in a place that is speaking clearly of your zeal for him? A, a place of wonder, of awe, not a place of embarrassment. Oh, that we would meet Jesus in such a way that he would be pleased with us. The only way that can happen, the only way is we are humbled before him, praying and seeking his face and living in obedience to the Holy Spirit's instructions. Can I say it again, what Moses told the people before they crossed over into the promised land? Life, death, blessing, cursing. Choose life. Will you not revive us again? Lord, that is our, our prayer. It's my prayer. Lord, In the Welch Revival, three words just resonated over and over and over. Those three words, God, bend me. Three words that speak of surrender, submission, a willingness to lay down our life for you a willingness to put our bodies on the altar of sacrifice, a willingness to say, I surrender all. God, bend us this morning. Lord, if there's anyone here that does not know you as their personal savior, Lord, I pray that they would be drawn to you and hear your call and respond to it. Lord, I pray for believers who right now are stirred in heart. Help them to be obedient to the Holy Spirit's instructions. Lord, we lift you up. Thank you for what you did. Let's stand and let's sing this together this morning in closing. Taking my sin, my cross, my shame. Rising again, I bless your name.
you all glory and all praise, for truly worthy is your name. Humble yourself before God. Pray. Seek his face. Repent of sin. Listen obediently to the instructions of the Holy Spirit. Lord, will you not revive us again? In Christ's name we pray. Amen.